morning, everyone. Um, I'm sure you all are aware that next Sunday is homecoming. We encourage you to reach out to your family and friends um, to join us next week. I hope you also read the blog um, that was in the e-messenger from uh, our form, one of our former pastors, who's now Bishop um, Carter. The video that we're about to show is just a little clip to encourage you again to come come out and be with us next week. It's the clip from Finding Fellowship that uh, the film Finding Fellowship of Mother Pearl giving a little bit of information. My parents may have been felt sad because they were leaving the church where their parents had built for us. But they never showed us that they were sad. They went along with us and everything was fine. We still had the memory of the good times that we had if it removed. But then when we went to Fairhaven, some of the things that we did at Pleasant View, we carried to Fairhaven. For instance, we had uh, homecoming. And when we first mentioned about homecoming, this is homecoming, that's like for baseball teams or football teams like that to have a homecoming. I said, no, we have a homecoming when we invite all the people who once belonged to Pleasant View and all over the county in Washington, North Carolina, wherever they were from and had lived here, some of them had moved back, they would come home that Sunday. And we would have sermons and we would have singing and we would just have a wonderful time together. We kept in touch. Why was homecoming important? It was a time of, of everyone Home, coming together. Say homecoming. homecoming was a time? Homecoming was a time for all of our friends and relatives and church members to come together and have a fellowship together with singing, dinner, speakers. It was just wonderful. And we still have that today at Fairhaven. It's like I say, we carried some of our things that we did to Fairhaven, um, which they didn't know at that time. But when they learned what it was all about, they fell right in. And so it just made it a wonderful time. It was a time when they could bring their friends and members who had left the church, and we all come together. And then we... It all sounds so simple, Grandma. <laughs> well, you know, you always have to have prayer, faith, and belief that these things will come to pass. And they did come together. Good morning, church. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Mother Pearl. <clears throat> it's so good to come back and see everybody. When I look out, I do see home. I see my friends. I see my family. I see my therapists. I see my alter egos. And when I hear Pearl, I can't even describe what I feel. She is an awesome icon. And to just share a brief story, this week, Pearl remembered to call me. I felt so honored and thrilled, but amazed that with all that she manages, she can think to call people within the congregation. I look forward to homecoming, and I hope you reach out and invite all friends, family, and those who used to attend Fairhaven who've not been back for a while. Please join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, 
tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done. His miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham. Children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Join me as we pray in one voice the prayer of the day. Forgive us, mighty God, when we doubt your strength. Assure us, faithful God, when we doubt your constant presence. Renew us, loving God, when we neglect to love others as you have loved us. Empower us with your strength and encourage us with your steadfast love. Unite us through the power of your Holy Spirit that we might live with a face, faith that honors you and abide with a hope that encourages others to know your love and your grace. Amen.
Christina. <clears throat> the word this morning is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we set about pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in and what is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but grumbling against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the Israelite community, they looked toward the desert. And there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight, you will eat meat, and in the morning, you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? But they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So let's have the children's moment. If the children who are listening could come close to their screens. Is all good, Nathan? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about wildflowers. I love wildflowers. I really enjoy walking in the woods or walking in the, in the mountains and seeing these, these beautiful flowers that no one has planted. Let me tell you a story about um, one of my favorite experiences with wildflowers. Mrs. Phillips and I were driving in Europe. I think it was in Switzerland. And we had to go through a very long tunnel. And uh, after spending many minutes inside this tunnel, we came out of the tunnel into the bright sunlight. And there in front of us 
was this wonderful field just filled with wildflowers. These wildflowers were dandelions. And dandelions are one of my favorite kinds of wildflowers. And dandelions are one of the wildflowers that I don't just see when I'm out uh, in the woodlands or, or, or in the mountains, uh, but I can see them in my own backyard. And another wildflower that I can see in my own backyard is clover. And I love to see the clover. Uh, another one that's a favorite that I can see right here in my yard is violets. And it's just so wonderful. It makes me so happy when I see these violets among the grass. Uh, another one that I like is Queen Anne's lace. It looks so delicate and uh, so lacy, which is where it gets its name from. <clears throat> and I got these pictures of, the, uh, of these wildflowers, the way we get all pictures these days. I went on the web and I searched for, for pictures of wildflowers. And interestingly, I found two different kinds of, of websites that talked about wildflowers when I would search for something like Queen Anne's Lace. I found websites that had beautiful pictures of Queen Anne's Lace that you could buy, or seeds for Queen Anne's Lace that you could grow your own Queen Anne's Lace. But then I also found websites that would sell you chemicals to get rid of Queen Anne's Lace or get rid of other kinds of wildflowers. Because you know, some people think that the things that I think of as being wildflowers they think of them as being weeds, as things that we should get rid of. And uh, I've been thinking about that and thinking about how sometimes people can be like that. Sometimes there are people that we meet who are not the, the same as everybody else. They're not those identical blades of grass that make the, the uniformly green lawn. They're different in the way they talk, or maybe they're different in the way they dress. Uh, maybe sometimes they do things that are a little bit annoying to us, or maybe they're just doing things that are different from the way everybody else does it. And I'm thinking, if we didn't have people like that, if we didn't have wildflowers, our life would be a whole lot more boring. It's awfully nice when among the grass, you also have some clover it really makes life a lot more interesting. And so what I want to do is to invite you that when you meet people that seem to you to be like weeds, maybe you should think of them as being wildflowers. And maybe if we all thought of one another as being wildflowers rather than weeds, maybe we could have a much more beautiful life. So now let's have a little prayer. Lord, help us to remember that everyone in this beautiful world that you've given us is your child. Everyone has value. Everyone is someone whom we should welcome and celebrate. Everyone is someone in whom we should rejoice. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Okay. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble. 
So friends, let us join together in a word of prayer. Savior, Savior, hear our humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass us by. Do not pass us by this morning, O God. And may your spirit be with us, touching our hearts, touching our lives, hearing the cries from the depths of our hearts. Open to us your lessons, your teachings this day. And gracious God, use me as your servant to preach your word to your people gathered here in love for you and in love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. The Lord has heard. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. He's touching me. She's looking at me. Did any of you ever hear those cries from the back seat while you were driving your family across the country? Or maybe you said those things to your parents, your brother, your sister, whoever was driving you. We go on trips and we get bored and we get tired. The people of Israel had been rescued from slavery. They had been saved from Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea by the power of God. And now they were in the desert walking with Moses and with Aaron journeying toward the promised land. One scholar I read said that they figured he'd, that the people had been on the road for about a month and they were starting to get tired. Boredom was setting in the food was running out and there was little water. And so they began to complain and to whine. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. We were better off in Egypt. At least in Egypt, we had food to eat. Maybe we should go back there. The people were conveniently forgetting one fact. That back in Egypt... They weren't free. Back in Egypt, they were enslaved and oppressed. When we can't see the future clearly in front of us, it can be incredibly frightening. It's frightening because we, if we can't see the future, we don't know what is ahead, and we're not sure how we to prepare for it, and we certainly can't control what's coming. And so in our fear, we look backwards. We look backwards and we justify returning to the old ways and the way things used to be. And we justify it by distorting our history, even if that means returning to injustice, oppression, slavery, and struggle. The Israelites would continue their journey for 40 years. And it would actually be the next generation who would reach the promised land. Along the way, as they journeyed with, with Moses and with God, they would learn something about God. They would learn something about themselves. Their faith would be formed. And they would uh, come together as community. So while they were wandering in the desert, one of the things they found out is that God hears their cries, their complaints, and their whinings. God hears. The Lord has heard your complaints, your groaning. 
God hears. It, those words hearken back to God's call of Moses, where um, God said to Moses, I've heard the cries of my people, and I know their suffering. So as they wander in the desert, the people are beginning to wonder if God has abandoned them and left them behind to just fend for themselves. But God was with the people. God was experiencing the same pain and struggles. And when the people cried out, God heard their voice. Some people say that when you complain to God, that we are being unfaithful, ungrateful, we're showing a lack of trust in our Savior. You know, especially the one who has rescued us and offered us salvation. In this, uh, what have you done for me lately generation that we uh, are living in, it is really easy to look past and to forget the blessings that God has offered us and gives us each and every day. And so when it gets difficult, when our stomachs growl and our resources become scarce, we throw up our hands in despair. It's okay in these times to offer our true feelings, our concern, our struggles, as well as our celebrations and our joys to God. It is always appropriate to do so. Being honest and vulnerable before God is part of building that vital relationship with God. It's one of the things we're learning in our Psalms class, that the people of Israel would cry out in their prayers and their songs and psalms, and they'd be honest before God. And as people cry out, God hears their cries. So the people of Israel grumbled against Moses, and Moses said, they're grumb actually, you're grumbling against God. And God heard their cries. The second thing that uh, the people of Israel learned on this journey is to rely on that intermediary. God gave them Moses as a leader, with Aaron uh, as a spokesperson. Moses was that one who would intercede for the people with God. God would speak to Moses, Moses would speak to the people, the people would speak to Moses, Moses would speak to God on their behalf. Several times along this 40-year journey, Moses would save the people from God's wrath and turn God's wrath back. And there are other times that Moses would enact punishment against the people, which might or might, or might not have been God's will. That's another sermon or sermons. There are times when, well, it, the scriptures tell us that Moses spent so much time with God in God's presence that his whole face would glow and he had to cover up his face like, with, in a hood when he came down the mountain and spoke with the people. But when he went up the mountain to talk with God, he could take the hoodie off. But in this particular story today, um, the intercession between Moses and the people is a message from God, a message that tells them God has heard your complaints and you will know that it was God who brought you out of Egypt. You'll know that tonight and you'll see my glory in the morning. And then as Aaron shared this message with the people, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud to remind them that God was with them. So rely on that intermediary. Go ahead and complain. It's all right. And the biggest thing that people learned in the desert was that God provides. God provides for their needs. In the evening, quail came and covered the ground. And the people could collect the quail and have meat. And in the morning, the dew would come down and leave this flaky substance, the manna, the bread from heaven. Now, the people couldn't figure out what manna was and had to be told, that's the gift that God gave you. And they would grow tired of eating quail, so they would complain some more. But God provided for the needs of the people. God provided just enough to satisfy their needs. They were to collect one day's worth of manna, except on the night before the Sabbath or the day before the Sabbath where they would collect two. 
If you collected more than you needed, it would go rancid. But the gifts of food kept coming until the people reached the promised land. God provided. Today, we journey with God. We have been saved. We've been rescued by the grace of Jesus Christ. And as we walk with the Spirit of God, we are transformed. Our hearts and our lives are transformed. As we journey with God, we learn about ourselves. We learn about God. And we are strengthened in Christian community. As we wander today, it may seem as if we are wandering in the desert. And we have all kinds of things to grumble and complain about and to question God about. We look around the world and we see this worldwide COVID pandemic with a deep economic fallout. We look at our country and we see the protests for racial justice in the face of police brutality against people with darker skin. It's all raising its ugly head once again, where we can't acknowledge what Bill was teaching the children this morning, that we're all beloved children of God. We look out and we see the hurricanes that, and the tropical storms that are lined up in the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico. We look out west and we see the out-of-control wildfires and the smoke that's traveling even as far east as Washington, D.C. We look at our country and we are as politically divided as, as we ever have been, at least in my lifetime. And our positions are so entrenched, we won't even listen to one another. And we want to cry out. And we want to complain and we want to ask God why. And that's okay. It's okay to offer our laments. To wonder. To struggle. To cry out in song, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me, do not pass us by. And then we trust that God hears our cries, that God is truly with us in our struggles, offering a way forward, even as our journey seems to be longer and longer and longer by the day. As Protestant Christians, we understand that we can take our prayers directly to God. We don't need an intercessor or an intermediary because Christ is our intercessor. But we all need a friend. We all need a colleague or a prayer partner or a, a, a spiritual mentor. And so we should be looking for those folks who we can confide in. Somebody to hear our deepest concerns, our real emotions, our confessions. Sometimes that's our spouse or another family member. Sometimes that's just a very deep and dear friend. Sometimes it is somebody who is at the church. Um, we need those people who will listen to not only our words, but the emotions that are behind those words and reflect our comments back to us kind of as a check and balance. We need that confidant who, we can, who will sympathize with us and empathize with us, and also that person who will set us straight when we start to stray. We all need that. We need that spiritual friend who will show us the word of God in Scripture, who will share the experiences of their lives that might help to bring us hope in, at our points of deepest despair. We need those people who will point to God's presence in our midst and pray for us when our doubts abound. Pastors and therapists, well, we have that role professionally. And we're here to fulfill that role. And our best friends may hold that role for us informally. And I pray that we, at times, are that person for someone else. Because we each need our person, if you will. One of the television series that I have enjoyed over the last 15 years or so, um, because it really does speak about human condition and about uh, conditions and relationships between people, is, is Grey's Anatomy, um, which is 
which went off the air at the end of the season last year. But one of the things that came clear year after year after year is Dr. Gray always had her person, whether that person was Dr. Yang or Dr. Karef. And they would be that person for each other. They could go to each other, sit down on a couch or the bed together and bear their souls. You're my person, was said many, many times. We all need that person to help us in this journey of life and faith. As we journey together, we trust that God is with us, that God does and will provide for our needs. So we trust that God is with us in the midst of this pandemic, that God is blessing the medical professionals and the scientists, offering discernment and wisdom so that we can figure out the best practices to avoid exposure to the virus, so that we can find treatments to uh, help each other, help people heal, and ultimately to find a vaccine to keep people safe. We trust that God is working in our midst, and we see hope in the number of people, individuals, and churches who are engaged in social justice, that we take hope that men and women of all ages and races are becoming active in the movement and striving to become anti-racists and build a society of justice. We trust that God is with us in the midst of an economic collapse. And we take hope that there are people that, for those who need the basic necessities of life, for people that have been devastated by hurricanes and fires, that there are people of faith across this land who are stepping up with generous financial gifts and sending supplies and others who are willing to go and to help muck out basements and others who are willing to go and rebuild homes, and others who are willing to sit with those who are grieving and hear their cries. We trust that God is with us in our divided country, that bridges might be built across the divides and the entrenched stanchions might be knocked down so that we can come together, find common ground, even as we mobilize to vote our conscience in a couple of weeks. We trust that God is in our midst, helping us to find our, our own role as individuals and as a congregation in serving God's people with love and showing hope to the world. As Mother Pearl shared in her video, we always have to have prayer, hope, and faith that these things will come together. We trust that God is leading us into God's grace-filled future. So as we journey in faith and in life, and as we continue to journey with God, we learn about ourselves, we learn about God, and we are strengthened in Christian community. So as we journey, remember that God is with us, that God hears our cries and knows our situation. May we as individuals and as a congregation be intermediaries for one another. Let us be that person for each other. And as we journey with God, may we trust that God is providing and will provide as we walk into God's promised future, a future that is filled with hope and peace and love. Guide us, O thou great Jehovah. Amen. I would invite you um, to use the raised hand feature and be prepared to offer joys and concerns at this time. What are the joys and concerns that are on your hearts? We ask you to continue to Guide us and strengthen us. Grant us a vision for ministry. Help the bonds of love between us continue to grow. And grant, oh God, that we might serve you 
with joy and with faith in these, in these times. And all of these things we lift up to Christ, trusting that you are with us along the journey. We pray in Christ's name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We do offer thanks for those who have uh, sent their offerings and pledges to the church and those who have sent them uh, via the, the web link. And let us pray a prayer of dedication for all the offerings that have been made this week. As we remember your wonderful works, we are grateful for your many blessings and are honored to return these gifts to you. As we offer our gifts, bless them and send them forth that others may be showered with your love and grace. In faithful trust, we pray. Amen. As our service concludes today, know that as we journey forth in life and in faith, that God goes with us, that God is present, willing to hear what is on our hearts and willing to guide us into God's promised future. Go forth in the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.